Ya. Hello. A very good morning to one and all present here. It gives me immense pleasure to extend to you a very warm welcome on behalf of IIT ASM Dhanbad. Me, Shashank Harsh, along with my friend Rohit Kumar, our host and co-host, respective be of today's webinar. For this great session, I would like to introduce one of our most passionate speaker, Mr. Satish Penmets. He completed his Master of Science degree in Electrical and Computer Engineering from the University of Texas, Austin, in the year 1999. Further, he completed his Master of Business Administration degree in Entrepreneurship and Finance from the Wharton School of the University of Pennsylvania, Philadelphia, in the year 2012. Currently, he is serving as a Chief Executive Officer at Groundhog, a mobile fleet management system for underground mining companies. It, it specializes in mine, helping mining mines, aggregates, quarries, and oil fields significantly, improving productivity and safety by going digital. He has made rapid inspect a mobile fleet maintenance software system for mining and heavy equipment companies. Sunsight of field management software for solar energy providers. He is expert in understanding a business context and recommending appropriate software solutions. I will now request Mr. Satish Penmetsa sir to please share knowledge and ideas with us. Throughout the session, co-host will be managing the chat functionality. You can enter your questions and comments in the chat box. Thank you. And now over to you, sir. You can now present your ideas. Thanks. Awesome. Hey, uh, thank you for the introduction. <laughs> uh, that must be a, uh, an older version of, of what we do. <laughs> uh, but anyways, uh, thank you for the introduction. It's a great honor uh, to speak in, 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 uh, at uh, Kanan. Um, thank you for having me. I mean, uh, for, for today, the main focus of the presentation will be around mine digitization, uh, automation, industry 4.0, and the future of work, where I'll be focusing on uh, you know, the technology trends and, and the types of skills that you might need in the next five to 10 years to be successful in the mining industry. Uh, I encourage a lot of questions, so feel free to uh, you know, stop me anywhere and ask uh, questions if you have any. Um, I look forward to a two-way discussion rather than a one-way conversation, or, or, or rather than a one-way talk. So with that, let's get started. By the way, uh, can you all hear me loud and clear? Yes, sir. You're audible. Yeah. All right. Thank you. So um, technology, uh, technology trends, the big picture uh, about technology. Um, technology has, uh, I mean, um, there's quite a few studies that have been done over the years around how technology adoption is, is uh, has happened over the years. Um, you know, back in the 1900s, a telephone was new technology. Right now, you know, smartphones, tablets, sensors, these things are, are new technologies. And over time, what we, uh, what, what uh, people that have done this sort of analysis have, have observed is, over the years, uh, new technology consumption spreads faster today. For example, it took nearly 80 years for telephones to become mainstream here in the uh, in the U.S. households, right? Um, electricity was sort of the same way, but I mean, because of government incentives and a government push, uh, it got done in about 40, 45 years. Uh, the auto industry also took, you know, close to 1960, which is about 60 years, to hit the 80% uh, consumption rates. And then you fast forward to, you know, the cell phones and internet and things like that, right? Cell phones uh, took off you know, right around early 90s, I remember getting my first cell phone in 2000, it used to be an old brick. Uh, now, uh, you know, everything runs off of this iPhone. Uh, the same thing with the internet as well, internet access sort of accelerated. So uh, most of the newer technologies that, uh, that have come out have seen faster adoption rates. Um, 
while most of this study was focused around the US, if uh, you will see parallels of these technology adoption curves in you know all over the world actually. Now I want to superimpose that sort of analysis with you know how fast new applications are starting to be adopted, right? At least the, the successful ones. It took many years. It took many years for people to adopt. Uh, to, to start using things like YouTube or Facebook um, and even WhatsApp and stuff. The technologies that have come out more recently, like TikTok, uh, you know, <clears throat> I'm pretty sure TikTok is, you know, uh, is at, at at least a billion, if not more users, right? So the adoption curves of newer technology has shortened it, at least the successful ones. Um, innovation, like you know, how we saw uh, you know, the telephones all the way through the internet comes in waves, where the introduction of a new uh, way of doing things uh, creates a, a, a new wave of innovation around use cases that get solved. The first wave started in about 1785. You know, just having water-based power was a technological innovation. <clears throat> and when you look now, uh, starting in, in, in 2020, the sixth wave has to do with AI, IoT, robots, drones, and you know, clean technology, um, those sorts of things. The, the previous wave had to do with making sure that everything got connected had to do with software, it had to do with uh, how people form social connections uh, on a pretty wide, uh, you know, internet-based infrastructure. So when you look at these sorts of innovation curves, uh, what you see is a lot of the old dominant players quickly get uh, replaced by uh, new players here in the US. You know, when I came to the US, in the late 90s, the leader in retail was Sears. Almost every mall had a Sears, right? And then came Amazon. Initially, and, and this is what most technology disruption also looks like is the initial version of the technology is inferior compared to the leader in the previous uh, iteration like Sears. <coughs> uh, like Sears was, when you look at uh, the automobile industry now, um, the old leaders have been General Motors, Ford, uh, Tata Motors, Hyundai, and, and so on. And the new uh, sort of uh, innovators, so to speak, uh, the Teslas of the world, the, the Chinese electric car companies of the world, where from a functionality standpoint, at least early on, uh, didn't provide all the bells and whistles uh, until you know they hit that uh, parity point and then have just started to explode. When it comes to mining, the the example that comes to mind is tunnel boring machines. Right in the past, uh, companies like uh, Robbins and Heron Connect uh, were the leaders. Now all of a sudden, the boring company by Elon Musk is starting to take over. Uh, most of the contracts, you know, at least quite a few of the contracts uh, that are coming up here in the US. Um, like I said, technology comes in waves. Uh, the, uh, when you look at what's going on with the internet, right? So uh, pre-internet, most interactions were, you know, people to people. I remember in the, in the late nineties, you know, we had just started using search uh, I have been on the internet even before Google started. So we used to use a, a, a search engine called Alta Vista and Excite. You know, things have changed with every new version, like it's Web 2.0, then social media. Now with Internet of Things, you know, everything's getting connected. Um, and with that, you start enabling new use cases. You have more reliable data. Uh, once you have more reliable uh, machine-based data or sensor-based data, you can start applying machine learning algorithms, uh, artificial intelligence, and so on to make coordinated systems um, 
So uh, there is an institute called the Institute, uh, the institute for the Future. Uh, what, what they do is they work on uh, long-term mega trends. Um, and according to them, uh, the way they define these mega trends was, you know, between 1995 and 2005, a lot of technology was just focused on computerization where, you know, Bill Gates said the famous words, he wanted to see a laptop on every desk, right? So, so that was the computerization wave. Um, now that you have sort of reached uh, saturation, um, right around maybe 2005, 2006 was where all the devices started to get connected to each other through the web, right? So almost everybody started getting internet connections. Now you could start doing business on the internet. Um, and then you could have multiple computers talking to each other, even though they were physically um, you know, separated. I remember back in the day when I used to work, at IBM, IBM Research in 2002, 2003, we used to have a big, uh, big, uh, uh, what's the right word to use? Data center on premises in the building. Now, <laughs> uh, you'd be foolish to, to, to install a data center within your company. Everything's in the cloud, right? So that was wave two, which was a connectivity wave. Now that everything is connected and also systems have been able to start uh, talking to each other, like, you know, through APIs, right? So if I want to, if we at Groundhog want to launch a server on Amazon, all we need to do is just call a set of APIs to launch a server, right? What coordination also means is that if I have a meeting say at three o'clock, uh, you know, maybe it's in San Francisco, uh, during, uh, in the morning, like at 11 o'clock, if it takes me 45 minutes to travel to San Francisco, uh, you know, with the coordinated system, if it detects that I have a meeting at three, Google also knows that it doesn't take me 45 minutes, but an hour and 45 minutes to get to San Francisco. So it'll tell me to leave early, right? So that sort of thing is called coordination where, um, uh, where multiple systems talk to each other, figure out uh, the best solutions, best potential solutions for the person, and um, you know make recommendations and so on. So uh, I wanted to provide this as a context to where we are going in terms of mind digitization and all of that stuff, right? So uh, what does innovation really mean? Um, there are two sorts of innovation. One is called in, uh, incremental innovation, and the second is disruptive innovation. Disruptive innovation is where you uh, create a dramatic change in the way business is done. For example, Amazon, when they started in 98, 99, they did not have a retail presence. Uh, same thing with, with Netflix, right? Back in the day, we used to go to these, uh, you know, video rental stores here in the U.S. It used to be called Blockbuster and so on. And in India, there were uh, <laughs> there were places where you could rent out VHS tapes or DVDs and so on. Netflix just changed the entire model, saying, you know, uh, we will just stream. Same thing with YouTube, right? Uh, in the past, all the content was being created by the big um, production houses, but then people were more interested, or at least there was a market for user-generated content that people like to see and so on. So those are disruptive innovations versus incremental innovations. Incremental innovations being, look, uh, adding more features to Excel to make your life easier. That's an incremental innovation. Uh, whereas disruptive, like I just said, right? You just change the entire value proposition. So what does this uh, disruptive innovation look like? You know, some of your professors might, might uh, be, uh, might, might know this is before AutoCAD, you had these big drafting tables where all of your mind maps and stuff were, were literally drawn out on pieces of paper. And you can actually see people using protractors uh, to, to find distances and so on. Now with AutoCAD, you don't see these drafting tables at all anymore. 
you know, I'd be surprised if, if anybody <laughs> ever saw a drafting table anymore. I don't know whether they still teach you this, uh, you know, the physical drafting uh, stuff in, in college anymore. Um, the same thing with uh, electric vehicles is Tesla just changed the way cars got built, right? There's, a, there's about a tenth the number of moving parts in a Tesla compared to say a BMW because everything is concentrated in the battery and in that, uh, what do you call the, the drivetrain. Uh, drones are, uh, you know, uh, coming closer to what we do is drones is another example of a disruptive innovation back in the day. You had to have like you know three or four people go out in the field to do surveys. Now all of these surveys are just done using drones, including volumetric analysis, all of that stuff. Now you can also in uh, you know on a drone you can also have additional modules to do uh, you know uh, 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 spectrographic analysis and so on to figure out what sort of material is in the stockpile and then figure out what the grade is of the stockpile. So. Uh, drones is is a disruptive innovation for you know the surveying use case uh, another huge one is uh, autonomous mining equipment right if 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 you've been to a mine site you've seen all these big dumpers um, in 2016 komatsu came out with this uh, autonomous dump truck that did not have a cab it was unheard of, unseen, uh, because it's it's fully autonomous, and and this is a, this is how the future looks for us, right? Is uh, you know try to get people out of harm's way. I know, oh, by the way, uh, there's also a big labor shortage in the mining industry, right? So mines are trying to attract new people, but they can't find enough people, it's especially here in the U.S., U.S., Canada, Australia. You can't find enough competent people to come work in the mine. So digitization and automation uh, is going to happen irrespective of you know what the old school mining guys uh, so, so, want to do. Yes, please. So uh, what type of uh, people like uh, the workers or the uh, like uh, the officers or the engineers? What kind of people? Well, so, uh, Sir, uh, sir, uh, sir, 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 sir. There's a shortage. There's a shortage of laborers. There's a shortage of mine engineers. There's a shortage of geologists. There's a shortage of exploration geologists, production geologists, uh, you name it. Big shortage, big shortage. There's a shortage of safety people that want to work in mines. So uh, we see that, we hear that all the time. Okay. So uh, digitization in mines, what are some of the trends, right? So mines need to deal with what is, uh, I mean, I don't know which sort of, uh, which side of the political spectrum you guys are on, but you know, uh, they have to deal with what's called Darwinism, which is if you don't innovate, you will die out just like the dinosaurs did. Uh, and, and the reason why they need to deal with this Darwinism is because commodity price pressures are always a recently there's been a route in the iron ore market, right? So you have to figure out a way to lower your overall C1 cash costs, or in the case of gold and stuff, they use a different metric called the all in uh, AISC, which is all in sustaining costs. Uh, and like I said, the mining workforce is aging, uh, and uh, most of the younger people uh don't like working in mines it's 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 a generational thing right so the overall mining workforce itself is shrinking worldwide so the only way you can get out of this sort of a uh trend is by increasing digitization and increasing automation there's a lot of companies including ours that have come up with uh you know uh, visions around fully automated pit-to-port ops. Um, 
and they fall into broad themes. It's either automation and, and robotics, or you know, having a digitally enabled workforce, uh, or you know, having an integrated enterprise pl uh, platform that that integrates your mind planning all the way to uh, processing and selling. Um, and then also having decision support systems that make it very easy for frontline workers to make uh, decisions, real-time decisions at the face. So my vision of what mining in say 2040 might look like is if you've ever seen the movie Minority Report, right? There's a scene where to find Tom Cruise, they deploy a set of these seekers, right, uh, in an apartment complex, and they go out and uh, search for humans and then check the eyeballs. In mining, it, uh, I can foresee where you have these autonomous mining bots going out and doing the drilling operation and doing in situ analysis of the material and then making a determination on whether to mine it up and push it to surface or just push it into a, a, a waste bay. Um, so these bots can be programmed to just go get the ore and minimize rehandling and maximize grade of every ton moved out from the mine to the process plant. Okay. That sort of a future is coming and it, it'll come faster than we think. Uh, I'm guessing the first versions of this will come out in about 15 years or so because I've already seen the bots uh, at Mine Expo. I actually <laughs> uh, you know, interacted with the Boston Dynamics dog. Uh, and I've also seen the modules that go on the Boston Dynamics dog uh, to do real-time in situ analysis of material. The reality though today is most mines are still a big black box, right? <clears throat> Especially underground mines are, are a black box in the sense that once the shift starts, you don't know what's going on underground until the end of the shift. Even in a lot of the open pit mines, they still have trouble getting trip counts in real time. So what digitization helps minds do is remove that lid off of that black box so that you have full visibility to what's going on in your mind. From a planning standpoint, from a day-to-day -day shift operation standpoint for underground as well as open pit, and then connecting that to the plant to look at what the demand for material is at the plant and making real-time adjustments to your mind plan your shift plan and to your mind plan to meet the plan's objectives, uh, to make sure that the plant receives the blend it needs. Um, so this is the entire purpose of digitization. And the future state technology required, like I said, you will need AI ML based greedy schedulers along with in-situ analyzers with autonomous equipment and you know, battery electric vehicles, because if you see the fastest cars in the world today are actually the Teslas in the sense that uh, you can get a lot more power through electrical uh, subsystems than you can through gas-based uh, engines. Uh, and then it also eliminates all the, the diesel uh, related health issues and, and whatnot. And like I said earlier, you'll also need special purpose mining bots along with survey drones. And you know, there's also this big push to have 3D printed parts on site. So you don't even need to maintain an inventory of spare parts for your engines, for your drifters on your drills and so on. So uh, one of the key insights that I got uh, was that at, at the current, uh, uh, this this is way back in maybe 2016, where Dean Gehrig at that time used to be the chief technology officer uh, at at Newmont, no, at Rio Tinto back then, was uh, he uh, basically said, 
when you look at all the technology that various sectors of the industry use, you will find that oil and gas is about 10 years behind in terms of uh, the technology curve. And then when you look at mining, <laughs> mining seems to be 30 years behind uh, oil and gas in terms of adopting new technologies. Uh, and yeah, the reality is it takes time to adapt and adopt new technology, especially in mines, because uh, like it or not, anybody above 50, 55, you will notice that they're not that uh, technology savvy. And, and they do resist um, a lot of the digitization initiatives proposed by the younger uh, group of, of mining engineers uh, that are coming in. So the old guard basically uh, is, is just okay with incremental innovation, like I described before. Uh, they are not okay with disruptive innovation because they are very disruptive. There's a lack of trust. Uh, whereas all the new people like, like you folks, when you get into the, into, the, into the job market, right? You're the kinds of guys that have grown up on the iPhones and Android phones. Uh, you are very tech savvy and you're excited about the future. And from a career standpoint, I mean, uh, you have no sunk costs, right? Everything's new for you. Uh, whereas the old guard, they always fear that their jobs are going to get taken away, all of that stuff. So they resist a technology, they, they resist change. It's especially true in the mining industry. Uh, GMG is the Global Mining Guidelines Group. Uh, it's based out of Canada, and they publish a, a lot of these guidelines about you know, how should a mine digitize, right? Uh, and they have this roadmap that says, you know, level one is basic, uh, whereas level six is highly automated. A highly automated mine uh, uses a closed loop integrated AI system that, uh, auto, uh, that has automated data capture through sensors, both on the machines, as well as just uh, in various locations on the mine. Uh, like gas monitoring, uh, air, air quality, water quality monitoring, and, and so on. And then that data gets fed into a machine learning algorithm that then works with multiple uh, technologies within the mine from a mine planning standpoint, operation standpoint, safety standpoint, to automate scheduling and dispatching. Uh, and then you can also automate the monitoring and the decision-making so that it's a well-oiled machine. So uh, just a plug for us, uh, Groundhog, we have a roadmap to help mines go from, you know, pen and, uh, uh, pen and paper or radio-based uh, communication uh, for, for production data plans and, and those sorts of things, put it into a platform and help them go all the way to AI-based uh, automated decision-making systems using greedy algorithms and, and things like that. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is that digitization does not happen overnight. Uh, we've seen companies that try to go you know, from no, uh, no digital at all directly into, hey, let me do uh, predictive maintenance of my equipment, right? And those sorts of initiatives always fail because any sort of digitization uh, needs to follow a process. And in our experience, this particular process works. Um, and you should not, I mean, companies should not expect magic to happen, right? Um, some of the things that you can do in the short term, you know, and, and, and this is a, a study that was published by the World Economic Forum, I, I think, where the time it takes to achieve maturity uh, is different based on the type of use cases that are being solved. For example, if you just want to set up a remote operation center, like, like you know, we have over here, if, if you saw my screen, when we started, we, you can monitor an open pit mine or an underground mine from here in Milpitas, whereas the, the mine itself is about 
300 kilometers away. You can also deploy smart sensors and, and things like that. You know, takes about a year tops. Uh, and then once you have sufficient data, then you can start doing advanced uh, analytics. You can do uh, modeling, you can do digital twins, those sorts of things. Uh, and you can also deploy connected worker type use cases. But to do true artificial intelligence and, and um, make decision support systems that take, uh, that make decisions automatically, those sorts of things take five plus years after you start that, after you start on that journey. So um, any questions so far? Okay. So uh, for mining, some of the technologies that are driving the future, like I said earlier, one of it is drones. Um, the second is, uh, you know, for, especially for underground, it's, you know, laser scanners uh, in addition to drones so that you can map out, um, so that you can map out the entire mine by sitting in your pajamas at home, okay? <laughs> Uh, and then image processing and, and uh, autonomous vehicles using technologies like LIDAR and, uh, you know, video, image recognition in video streams, okay? And all of these technologies are already here. I mean, nobody's talking, you know, the vision kind of things. Companies are already using this in real time now. Uh, and then also, uh, having flexible networks and omnipresent networks so that you can enable remote operations. One of the biggest expenses in places like Australia is fly and fly out crews, right? Most of the mining happens in very remote areas uh, where besides the mine and the camp, there is no life uh, around them for, you know, about 300 to 500 kilometers, right? So how do you enable people to operate equipment uh, sitting in Perth, for example, or even in India and, and operating machines uh, in, in Western Australia, right? In fact, at the Mine Expo this year, Komatsu demonstrated uh, one of these tele-remote things where at Mine Expo, somebody was operating a shovel that was operating in, in Arizona. So this sort of technology is here and it, it requires omnipresent networks, which we do have now, and it has to be extremely reliable networks as well. And like everybody says, right? AI and machine learning for everything. <laughs> um, so uh, with all of these, uh, technology is what does a digital mine look like is typically headquarters basically sets, uh, you know, yearly and quarterly goals, which then goes into a mine planning system to model uh, which stops need to be mined or which rooms need to be mined and, and things like that, which then gets fed into a AI based scheduler that generates these plans for, for every shift. I mean, what equipment should perform what kind of work in the shift so that we maximize the net present value of the old body. Okay. Uh, and then, you know, obviously you'll always need some sort of uh, modifications to these uh, schedules because humans need to be able to, humans still are better at gut feel type uh, decisions. And, and that is still superior at the moment to whatever AI based uh, schedulers can generate. Uh, so basically humans override and make adjustments to the schedules and then you can automatically assign operators to various sorts of equipment. Uh, and, and, and this is what companies using our software or our platform for digitizing their mind do, uh, then you basically 
streamline your shift change operations, distribute the plans to all of the operators, and then supervisors can make changes in real time to those plans. Uh, you do your digital safety inspections, you track your production to your plan in real time. And then as and when downs and delays occur, give dispatch maintenance and the operators and the supervisors sufficient data very fast so that they can make adjustments to the plan so that they can still catch up on their schedules. Um, and also, especially in the case of underground mines where it's hard to get network to the face, you have other enabling technologies like peer-to-peer -peer so that you can get data from the solos or the markers that are working at a face where it's super expensive to install uh, Wi-Fi access points all the way to the face. Um, and then- Sir, peer-to-peer uh, -to, -peer to get uh, data the last line. Sir, uh, I have a question like, uh, how is it uh, possible to uh, tackle the problem of connectivity in the undermine, uh, underground mines? Like, uh, there's a lot of problem now, sir. Yeah, so the way you do that is you install access points along the main ramps and the high traffic areas where there aren't expected to be any blast, impacts of blast operations. Uh, and then uh, you enable this thing called peer-to-peer where tablets can talk to each other, machines can talk to each other. So tablets in these equipment can talk to each other and say if, when the haul truck gets back onto the main ramp or passes by an overpass, it can also send, it can send its own information and it can also send the information from uh, the LHD or the bogger uh, back up to the cloud. Also, mine mates and supervisors always go to the face to interact with the workers at the face so they can exchange information as well. Uh, and when the mine mate or the supervisor gets back in his uh, bolero or, my, uh, or, or you know, uh, any other Jeeps, right? And once they hit the network, they'll be able to get information from all the faces um, back up to the servers. Okay. Okay. So uh, you can also perform digital or uh, uh, or control uh, just using your tablets. And then once you have drones, you should be able to get your drone to do the analysis, and I mean in situ analysis and update the grades of material in the muck piles uh, soon after they got blasted or when they got moved. Uh, and then you also do face mappings um, where you don't need a person to go underground to figure out, you know, all the dip break azimuth angles and whatnot. Uh, with digitization, you should be able to monitor all of your broken ground inventory, uh, both in the in these underground muck bays and so on, as well as in the open pit operations, and then. Wherever you install these smart environmental monitors, if there's no person uh, uh, in a particular level, you don't need to turn on lighting, right? So you can have those sensors. These sorts of sensors already exist in buildings today. It just needs to be applied to mines, right? Uh, gas monitors, water mo monitors, water quality uh, monitors, and so on. And then um, basically you also start getting notifications of you know, misfalls, downs, delays, so that you can proactively manage the mine. And then at the end of the day, the mine manager, the production superintendent, what they want is a 360 degree view of the mine in near real time, in real time, wherever possible, if not near real time. Because today, one of if if you don't have digitization, the 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 production status is almost always at least a shift too late, right? Because somebody needs to analyze all the data, make adjustments to the plan. By the time the guy makes adjustments to the plan, people have already go, gone underground, 
right? Uh, once you start implementing digitization, we've seen mines improve their production rates by 36% within you know, six to nine months, right? Uh, but again, any sort of digitization, it's not just about the technology, you also need to have the people in place to drive these performance improvements and also change the processes that has changed how the miners run from a day-to-day -day standpoint to actually make these sorts of uh, production improvements. So given this, what do the jobs of the future look like, right? Again, this is my personal opinion. Uh, others may have other opinions. Uh, at the core of all of this, data is the new gold, okay? The mining engineer uh, or the geologist, right? Um, by using the right tools, you'll be able to figure out what the material is, all of that stuff. So to succeed, you need to be able to understand the data, analyze the data. So data sciences to me uh, will be a skill that's extremely valued in mining. So anything that has to do with statistics, anything that has to do with coding, managing databases like SQL Server, or for us, we use a database called Couchbase. So anything that has to, and, and uh, you know, tools like Python, uh, so that you can run large scale analytics on the data sets. Uh, R is another statistical software. So you have to have these sorts of skills so that you can differentiate yourself in the industry, okay? You have to have, uh, well, I think if you are able to take two separate systems like, you know, Vulcan and data mine and figure out how they can talk to each other, that, that'll be a very valuable skill because right now at most mines, information still sits in silos and integration is required so that you can maximize the value of the data you have and make better decisions. Better decisions that will increase your overall output at a lower cost, okay? A lot of uh, emphasis also needs to be put into data visualization. It's one thing to look at data in tables, but then a picture is worth a thousand words. So if you can figure out how to represent that, uh, you know, uh, terabytes of data into human digestible visuals that give you insights into what's going on. I think that's a huge skill that'll be in, a, in, in big demand, okay? And also people that can do hardcore math, AI ML. AI ML is a very loosely used word. People that just do some amount of statistics say that, you know, they've done AI ML or, you know, people that have just done a Coursera project on trying to identify cats by executing a, a few lines of code, that's not AIML. AIML is actually understanding the math and the statistics behind how that cat image detection works, right? So that's actually hardcore math and it's, very, it's a very hard problem. So those are some of the skill sets that will be required uh, for the workforce of the future. In the case of mining, for example, right, stop stability, right? You can run ML algorithms to figure out whether you have to reinforce or not, right? And that will be a combination of, you know, doing pull tests along with image processing and so on, right? So uh, your standard algorithms that are used to detect cat faces is not gonna work you'd have to be able to come up with the new math to figure that sort of things out, okay? So, uh, like I said, you know, the old guard still is fearful of uh, technology because some of those jobs are gonna go away in these next 15 years. Things like, you know, surveys, uh, well, people that do surveys, I, you know, <laughs> in 15 years, I don't think there'll be any any surveyors anymore. If anything, there'll be a guy 
or a girl that runs a drone to do the survey. Okay. Uh, also with mind planning, these mind planning tools are getting smarter and smarter by the day, but you can start, once I have all the drill samples, I can import all of that data uh, into a mind planning tool uh, to come up with, you know, how to go out and, and uh, plan the mine, both in the short term as well as for the life of mine. Uh, also environmental scientists. Was that a question? All right, so, uh, you know. Sarath, you can ask your question. Oh, okay. So Sharad is asking a question. There's actually multiple questions here. How much cost to establish digitization of a medium term mine? It's, it's I mean, you can, uh, most mines at least uh, set aside, say 50 to $100,000 to start on that journey for mine digitization. You can start with something smaller with, with simpler use cases, but to really see the impact in ROI, you have to be prepared to, uh, you have to be prepared uh, to spend, you know, some amount of money um, because the ROIs are, 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 are pretty good. Ashutosh Kumar is asking for a remote control of my screen. I don't know who Ashutosh is, so I'm going to decline that. Uh, you can talk. Uh, I, mean, I mean, please feel free to ask a question. The other question that Shorath has asked is how good is Groundhog compared to Hexagon and Venko mining systems? So this is what I will say, right? Remember that innovation happens in cycles, right? Venko and Hexagon were built in the 1980s, 1980s, 1990s. Their technology has not evolved. We started in like 2016 and 2017. And up to about two years ago, our functionality was still behind Venko and Hexagon and Mindstar. Now we've surpassed. Underground, we are number one. Open pit, you know, uh, I think we are at parity with, you know, the Venkos, the Mindstars, the, the modelers of the world. Uh, just, just because they've been working at this problem for 40 plus years, 35 plus years, I think it'll take us another year, year and a half to catch up. Uh and get to parity with those systems for open pit. Underground, you know, uh, nobody comes close to our capability currently in underground. Does that answer your question, Sharad? Well, Sharad's probably on mute, okay. Um, so the new grad skills uh, in the past, right? Uh, people used to value mining engineers that knew how to code because all of this data would be in Excel files and mining engineers that knew how to import that data into a database like Excel or SQL Server and then start running reports off of those were highly valued. I think now, uh, it needs to transition to, you know, thinking more like a computer engineers, uh, more like computer engineers and data scientists that also know mining. You have to be a computer science guy that also knows all the fundamentals about mining, right? I think those are the types of people that will have huge impacts on the, at, at their new roles at, at, at mining companies. Uh, so basically, you know, companies will start moving from being gold miners or coal miners to data miners, 
right? Where the primary activity is actually mining the data and figuring out how best to uh, to maximize the NPV of your deposit than you know being a gold miner, knowing hey, I know how to mine gold, or I know how to do you know Ruben Pillar really well, right? So I think most of the newer grads, my heavy recommendation to you is invest time and effort in learning computer engineering and algorithms and statistics in addition to your uh, mining curriculum around you know mining methods, uh, how to identify various kinds of rocks and so on. I'm probably, <laughs> I'm probably, uh, going against what the professors are probably telling you, but I, I think it's a reality, okay? I would rather punch you folks in the face than stab you in the back. Okay. <laughs> uh, any other questions? Any other questions? Uh, this is the part of the presentation that is uh, scripted. Um, but yeah, I'm open for any, any sorts of questions you may have. Just so you know, my background is a computer science background. I've also done an MBA. 10 years ago, the only thing I knew about mining was how to spell mining. We, I got into mining because I missed a flight. Okay. It's a much longer story, which I can you know, <laughs> uh, say over a glass of beer or something like that. But you know, 10 years ago, I missed a flight and that's what got me into mining. Now I have personally spent more than 250 hours underground, mostly in gold mines, zinc mines, copper mines, and even in open pits also doing drive alongs and stuff uh, to the point where I think I can get a master's degree in mining engineering. <laughs> Not that I will, but uh, I know about all the mining methods, all of that sort of stuff. So. Sir? Yeah. All this transformation occurs, like uh, from computer science to even almost to different field. Yeah, so uh, how was the transformation? I think it was fairly easy in the sense that, you know, as long as you're a problem solver, right? At the core, you know, what sort of a person are you? If, if you're a problem solver, then you'll be able to figure out uh, how to address and fix a problem that a customer has, right? So one of the first problems we were ever given was uh, they were using Jigsaw at an underground mine, okay? And, and they basically said, you know, and, and when you ask them why it was because that system required network and it, it, it still wasn't as reliable even if there was a network. So that's when Krishna, our co-founder and I, uh, we knew we could transfer data between two tablets for peer to peer. Then we went in, spent about maybe 30, 40 hours on the ground, just doing drive alongs with truck drivers, you know, uh, sitting with jumbo operators, sitting with bolter operators, uh, going around with supervisors, just understanding what their life looks like, right? And then we said, you know what? Right? We can build software to streamline their life, right? Yeah. Once you hear what your customers want, once you hear your customers' pain points, right? Then you can develop interfaces that alleviates that those, those pain points. And for that, it doesn't matter whether it's mining, it doesn't matter if it's retail, it doesn't matter whether it's airlines or ports, right? As long as you have the mindset to sit down, put yourselves in the shoes of the people that are dealing with those problems, empathize with those problems, and then create solutions that eliminates that pain. Uh, and then just focus on one sector, one thing, uh, then I think you'll be successful. Uh, uh, you know, 
with all of this, right, once you start hearing the terminologies, you know, I didn't know what an agent was. I didn't know what a stop was. But once you go see it, right, it's not rocket science. I'm not doing any rock mechanics or anything, right? But once you see the sort of analysis they are doing for figuring out ground support stability, right? Once you see that Excel file, it's a, it's, to us, it's an algorithm. It's a calculation. And these calculations you can find anywhere, right? It's, it's a process of making and packaging all of this in a easy to use uh, piece of software. Uh, so looks like Sharath had another question. Sir, is there any problems you faced in upgradation of a ground groundhog? Problems that we have faced in the upgradation of groundhog. What does that mean? Can you be more clear? With the question, please. I don't think I understood the question. What do you mean by upgradation of Groundhog? Who asked the question? You're on mute, by the way. Sarath, you can unmute yourself. Any other questions? I know we have another half hour or so. Um, how do you want to spend the next half hour? Yes, um, There's like five, or five more slides. Uh, if you want me to show the system real quick, I can do that as well. Wait, I'll, uh, I'll let you guys tell me. I have a question, Satish. Am I audible? Yes. This is Hi, thank you very much. Uh, this is Naresh. I'm CEO of Texan Foundation. Uh, thank you very much for a very informative session. Uh, as uh, you mentioned that the mining industry is like decades behind other industries in adopting technology. In mining, uh, we have a saying that we are the first to adopt second. So most of the technology that we use in the mining industry probably evolved somewhere else and then we adopt those technologies in the mining sector. Now the technology and all the data that we generate is for the people. Now when there is a reluctance by the people, by the decision makers, like you said, the, the, the old guard, uh, mostly, uh, particularly in countries like India, we always deal with such people only. They are a bit reluctant. As soon as we talk about data, as soon as we talk about, you know, surveillance, monitoring, everything will be, you know, there will be a, like a big brother watching everything. Everybody becomes uncomfortable. And you must have seen such problems, you know. I, I'm not sure how things work in Australia and Europe and in, in American minds, but in Indian minds, that's a big problem. It's um, not an India only problem, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> uh, like what, what, what is the strategy? How do we tell people that it's good to adopt technology? It's good that what you are doing will help you increase your production. In India, in coal mines particularly, the output, output per month shift you can see is horrible. And they can, you know, uh, within half a decade or so, companies like Coal India Limited, they can do, you know, massive changes. But there's a huge, you know, reluctance. Coal India is sitting on like billions of dollars of cash and not interested in using technology. They actually take pride that we are, we are, we are employing like half a million people and we are actually not just a company. They call it like, they treat it like, you know, a CSR initiative that we are giving employment to so many people. As soon as new technology will come, these people will lose their jobs big challenge so yeah like, like what's your take on this so my take on this and i may be politically incorrect is it's good that privatization has come along right uh, these these uh, the they did the coal block auctions and there's a lot of private companies now starting to produce i think they should privatize coal india limited to really unlock 
the productivity and, and uh, these sorts of things. Uh, as long as it's a government run entity, I mean, there is really no incentive to increase productivity. It's a reality, right? Um, so yeah. the way we have dealt with, uh, uh, I don't know how to put this diplomatically, you call them Luddites. Have you heard of the Luddite revolution when, you know, you when Europe started to go through this mechanization process, especially in the UK, there was this whole Luddite uh, revolution against tech, right? But it's inevitable. It is inevitable, right? Um, I hate to say this, but, you know, uh, if there is a mine manager or a general manager that is more than 50 years old, chances are uh, they won't adopt <laughs> Groundhog, for example. But if they are younger than that, right, they love technology. And, you know, we start, wherever there are people in senior positions, that are extremely comfortable with tech. Those are the kinds of guys that are driving all of these changes. And in coal India, I mean, as when the current cater uh, of, of, of people that are more than 50 retire in like 15 years or so, I think that's, that's when you'll start seeing all the massive changes. And it's also cultural, right? I don't know how you would change that culture. culture Organization culture, uh, organizational culture is, uh, it's, it's really hard to change. It's extremely hard to change. Uh, and the only way I think you can change that is, is you know, privatizing Coal India Limited and, 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 and not the entire thing. I mean, privatize individual minds. Uh, I would think that's the only way to go. It's a blunt, honest opinion. <laughs> I would rather uh, be honest about my assessment than give you a politically correct answer. No, 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 that's very good what you said. Privatization of Coal India Limited is like, you know, far, far away, but the coal block auctioning that is happening right now, uh, it's very actually fair practices which are being followed, at least in the last regime, it was not like this. Like recently, a mine did not operate, even they took a mine from Adani, and that's, I think, is a big step from the government side. But no. still big challenges, actually, in, in Indian coal industry. One question about Groundhog, actually, you guys are specifically focused on software development, no hardware. Um, uh, yes, we work with partners for hardware. We integrate with other hardware providers, for example, for load sales and stuff, right? Uh, the, so we know which battles to pick because there is technology that already exists. We just need to be able to find it and integrate with it. So this is a, a telemetry unit that talks Bluetooth. And this is how we pull data off into the tablets and then put it into the cloud, right? Uh, same thing with TPNS sensors and so on. We don't need to manufacture those sensors. Others already do. We just need to figure out a way to find the right manufacturer and pull their data in. So we work with partners. We started in 2016. Uh, we started a focus on mining in 2016 as a company we started in 2012. Um, so you only have a limited number of resources in terms of money and time and capabilities and you have to pick what you're super good at, you know, uh, be the best at it. I would rather be the best at what we do than a, a jack of all trades. Okay, that's, that's very interesting approach. Yeah, if you try to be everything to everybody, uh, you'll be spread too thin and you won't move anywhere. You can't move. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm on your side on this one, actually. Yeah. 
So, so when you said that, like people in the 50s, I hope that the younger generation who is listening and the younger people who are graduating from IITs and ISMs, they will understand that uh, the way mining is done is being changed. And in a, in a few years or so, maybe in a decade, when they are in, in the positions of power, they will understand the value of technology. Like in India, if you look at, you know, again, like Pull India Limited, uh, they haven't recruited manpower in a long time. There's a big gap, you know, general managers are in their 50s and the young engineers are in their 20s. There's a big communication gap. And whenever people think of, you know, mining, uh, they think of, you know, underground mines and, you know, uh, not a very good work environment, not getting paid very well, at least in India. So then it's a problem that we are not attracting a lot of quality manpower. But down the line, uh, mining is uh, more about computer science than just, uh, you know, traditional mining. The, the way mining is done is changing very fast. And I hope that the things will improve over time. Yeah, it's good to see. <clears throat> I mean, we've hired interns from Dhanbad and we are super impressed with their capabilities that have been demonstrated so far, right? They're very tech savvy, um, very articulate as well and have a point of view, right? Uh, and you know, I'm super excited about all the new people that are getting into mining. Uh, when you are talking about this technology, you know, peer to peer and all that, you are mostly working in metal mines. Coal mines have a different set of challenges, like you know, DGMS approvals and gas safety in the mines and all those problems. So you are working on that, or you are just going for let's solve the metal mining problems first, and then we will go back to coal mining. Yeah, like I said, industry focus, right? So initially, the first four years, 2016 to 2020, we were exclusively focused on underground metal mines only. Okay. And well, once you figure that part out, then you expand. And so, okay, fine, next word. And over the past two years, we've also been doing open pit. Again, metal, non-metal, uh, metal. And then we also work with aggregates now. Um, and uh, for coal, also we'll only do open pit because most of our software runs on standard tablets. And like you said, DGMS won't let you take a Samsung tablet underground. Yeah, because it's not a permissible device. And I completely understand. So we said, you know what, don't even focus on that. There's enough other market to, to go after. But then yeah. for the- DGMS is a big challenge actually. Yeah, text yeah. So uh, uh, like I said, there is uh, there are multiple products. Uh, 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 there's, a, there's, there's a set of capabilities that we provide, right? Uh, give me just a quick second as I bring up this particular slide. Um, even the and even underground coal mines, they still use our product. Uh, as long as it's it's operated in the op center, you know, you should still be able to use the products. So for example, you don't need the level three, you can still do level one and level two that itself gives you a lot of productivity improvements. And as long as they have sensors that feed data through the mod bus or even the CAN bus on the equipment, uh, right? Then we should be able to pull the data in and do all the uh, analysis in the cloud, so. Yeah. Any other questions, comments? Sir, there's a question in the chat box. What do you think of about off-earth mining? Uh, it's good. Uh, I mean, in my twenties, I you know I would have been super excited about it, but now I'm like, well, that's somebody else's problem. Like Elon Musk first send people. <laughs> Do asteroids and stuff first, and then you know we'll figure out how to do <laughs> the mining uh, off Earth later on. Um, I think there is potential, but I mean it's 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 still very academic at at this stage. I would not, I mean from a practical standpoint, I would not 
focus much on it. If you're looking at off-earth mining as a career, uh, you know, I would smack you with a dose of reality and say, <laughs> find something more practical. Great concept. And I've been reading about this for the past 25 years. Right. Same thing with uh, undersea mining, right? Lots of potential, some amount of progress, but then there is enough mining that that you can do on the surface and even underground. That you know, going undersea is not as pressing of a need right now. Uh, maybe 20, 30 years down the line, uh, maybe maybe at that time, right? Any other questions? So, sir, can you share your best experience in the field of digitalization or mining, mines where things? Best experience? Yes, sir. Um, best experience or uh, maybe biggest problem that you have solved? So the biggest think... problem that we have solved is actually trying to convince uh, <laughs> old school miners and, and I'll, I'll, I'll give you a perfect example. I'll give you a perfect example uh, less. So one of the first underground mines that we were working at, right? The, uh, when we were showing all the apps on, 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 the, uh, on, the, on the iPads, you know, all we were hearing was, look, this will never succeed. This will never succeed because you know, there were people like Lester, okay? Lester is what you would call a, a technophobe, right? A technophobe being, you know, he was still having a flip phone in 2018, okay? And this is Lester. This is Lester, okay? And they said, look, if you can convince Lester to start using the app, I think you won't have a problem. <laughs> so I said, okay, fine. I mean, show me Lester. And, and Lester and I did a drive along on this, on his AD30. And, you know, we put the tablet in the cab. I said, Lester, all you got to do when you come in at the start of a shift is click this button. And then once you go in, all you do is just press next, 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 right? And just verify that, you know, uh, that your trip counts were, act uh, were accurately uh, captured and tracked. And the guy goes, is that it? I mean, I was thinking it was going to be this big, huge, you know, hoopla kind of thing where I had to jump through hoops and whatnot. This seems pretty easy, right? So with the older generation, especially, you know, on the ground operators, they all fear technology. So you have to have somebody that does good change management, that does the ride-alongs, that can speak their language, speak their language as not English, but you know, speak at their level, you know, figure out what's going through his mind and saying, look, Lester, there is nothing to be worried about. Uh, all we are saying is you tap, tap, tap. Okay, so that's, that's, that's one example. Oh, and by the way, as soon as Lester said, oh, this seems pretty easy, from the next day onwards, every, everybody else fell in line. Because the talk was, look, if Lester can do it, anybody can do it. If Lester has no problem in doing it, <laughs> why the hell are you, gonna, you know, complaining that it's too hard or too complicated, right? So you have to find that Lester. So the biggest challenge when it comes to digitization in any mind, any mind, it's not about the technology. The technology is the easiest part. The most difficult thing is this, this thing called change management. How do you influence people to change? Which comes to my next recommendation, right? I read this book when I was in college and I still use these principles today. It's, it's called, uh, you know, and Naresh can see that I've, I've quickly looked them up. <laughs> How to, 
win friends and influence people. This book was written in, in the 1920s, 1920s, 1930s. I would strongly encourage each one of you to read this book. You'll be able to read the book in like two days, okay? But it opens up, it at least opened up for me what's important. Mining uh, is a very relationship-based business, okay? You can have the best technology in the world. They don't care unless they feel that you care about them, okay? And a lot of times people just focus on features and trying to sell, sell, sell. That's not how mining works. Mining is all about relationships. Mining is all about relationships. It's not about who you know, but you know, how well do you know them? Can you, can you speak at that, their frequency? Can you empathize with them? Uh, and, and later on, they'll be your best uh, promoters, you know, so to speak. Okay. So the two books I to... recommend. Uh, sorry, sorry. I think that, that goes to, you know, any industry, not just mining, everywhere, you know. It, it's true, actually. Like, if you care about people, as you said, technology is always given. If economics makes sense, technology can be built. But ultimately, convincing people to use that technology is the biggest hurdle everybody has to, you know, go through. Completely agree. So for the folks on the call, the two books that I would recommend everybody read is one is How to Win Friends and Influence People. And the second one is Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. Read the original version that was published in the 1920s. These two books have influenced the way I think uh, uh, to succeed in life, you also need to have a burning desire to achieve something, right? And this book articulates that extremely well. If there were only two books that I would recommend to anybody in my life, it would be this. I think and grow rich. And the second is, is um, how to win friends and influence people. I'm I would pretty like to add there's a hazard other books, but just, these just two one more book. Satish, if you can add one more book by Daniel Kahneman, Thinking Fast and Slow. It's about decision uh, yeah. making and how people make decisions. It's a great book. You won't be able to read in a couple of days. It will take some time to go through the process of you know reading that book, but it's an excellent book. Completely yeah. agree. This is also a great book. There are others as well, but let's, let's, you know, <laughs> have a small <laughs> It interest. will become a recommendation session then. Yeah. Uh, there is the case of uh, Lester. There's also the case of Andy Anderson's similar story. Heavily resistant to change. But then, you know, once you dumb it down to just saying, hey, just enter your truck identifier, truck number over here, everything else is automated, then the guy gets on board. Because until then, he was resisting, resisting, resisting. And the other thing is, you know, all of these guys in the uh, senior management at, at, at Mines, they always look at reports, right? Uh, for us, we were generating reports in our formats. And, you know, they didn't like our formats. Then we went back and asked, right? I mean, why is this report not useful to you? They'll say, look, every day for the past 10 years, I've been looking at this report and I know what I'm looking for, right? So all we had to do was tweak our reports to that format. The data is the same. The insights are the same, but just formatting difference. And all of a sudden, <laughs> it increases adoption. So you have to have that empathy and insight to understand where the hurdles are. And if it's a small change, make it, right? So we have five more minutes. I mean, I, I can stay for longer. So there, there is a question from a participant. Sir, from Vasik Hussain, uh, he has asked, uh, how about mining on moon? 
I have read that it has abundance of silicon, iron, etc. Et How do I feel about it? I mean, there is abundance of sil uh, silicon, iron, etc. on on the earth. It's still not that expensive. So, <laughs> you know, whenever people figure out the unit economics, uh, where it says getting iron from the moon is cheaper than mining it on Earth, that's when I'll start focusing on, 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 on that side of the market. Yeah, okay, sir. It's, it's a, yeah, it's a good aspiration. So uh, let me, um, all right. Since we only have five more minutes, let, uh, uh, let me just go through the rest of the deck. So I'm Groundhog, right? So our vision in life is to see every mind digitized because we strongly believe that a digitally connected mind produces a lot more tons faster and most importantly safer. Many a time you will see that the most important thing that comes out of a mine is the miner, not the ore, it's the miner. So digital, digitally enabled mines uh, have a better safety infrastructure than the ones that are not digitized, okay? Our mission in life, is to bring all the latest and greatest innovations that are happening here in the Silicon Valley and apply it to mining. Because we see a huge benefit once mining companies start using the same sorts of technology that is being used in, in, in the Valley. Uh, we have been very widely published in the industry. Uh, we do a lot of conference papers here in the US and up in Canada. Uh, we work with a lot of companies worldwide and, uh, you know, just know that we are hiring. Okay. Any other questions? I'm, I'm more than happy to stay for longer if you guys have other questions. So you're such an expert in this uh, field of digitalization and of mining. Uh, so we would, like, we would like to, uh, it would be a pleasure if we get a chance to work with you as a team or if we. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Looking forward to it, man. So any other questions, sir, comments, uh, concerns, sir, feedback? Sir, on what basis uh, do you hire? I'm sorry, what? Sir, on, on what basis do you hire? On what basis do we hire? Uh, all we are looking for is smart people that know how to solve problems. As long as you have, and, and, and somebody that's highly motivated Okay, because software, you can just pick up. I don't care what you know, I care about it. We care about what you can do. And I strongly believe that problem solvers can go figure out, you know, the right technology, the right sensors, the right hardware, the right algorithms, as long as they are smart enough and as long as they know how to solve problems. I'm not talking about textbook problems, no. I'm not talking about textbook problems. Bookish knowledge, <laughs> I could care less about bookish knowledge. Show us what you can do practically, and, and I think we'll be able to uh, flourish at Groundhog. Okay. Show the initiative, show the initiative. What is the scope of startups which focus on software for the mining industry? I think it is huge. It is huge. And my advice here is don't go after the big guys, right? If you are trying to start a new piece of a new startup, don't go after what Vulcan does or don't go after what Acquire does. 
There are other smaller problems that nobody focuses on, which is still a big pain point in the, in the industry for us. It was underground mines did, did not have a reliable fleet management system or a shift scheduling system, which is what we focused on. We didn't go against the Venkos and the, and the modelers on day one. We did not. We went where they were weak. Right? So similarly, I think there's a huge scope for, for startups that focus on mining software. Again, go after the use cases that the big guys don't focus on and then make a mark, provide good customer service, provide amazing quality. Uh, and I think, I think you'll flourish. Any other questions? Was this even useful to you folks? Let, let me hear from, from the folks that have been listening. Was this session even useful? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. That's only two people talking. Yes. And the two people are the organizers. <laughs> Everybody else is on mute, so I don't know. Yes, sir. Yes, They're saying extremely useful. useful. Very useful and inf informative. Good to hear. Good to hear. Anything else? Any other questions, comments, feedback? Sir, how much annual profits for your groundhog? That's that's a private thing. I'm not going to uh, comment on that. Okay, okay. The other thing that you have to be smart about, Sharad, is figuring out what is good to ask in a public forum versus a private forum and things like that. That requires emotional intelligence. So you should work on that. <laughs> okay, okay. Don't mind. All right. So how do you think environmental problems can be handled by digitalization of mines? So there are two parts to that problem, right? There are sensors and then there are actuators, right? <clears throat> For environmental, like if you have gas monitors, water quality monitors uh, and stuff, you get the information. What we've seen at a lot of mines is, is they get the data but they don't act on the data. You have to be able to close the loop. That is, if your pond has a, a, a pH measure, a measurement system, then you also have other chemicals that you can add if the pH balance goes out of whack, right? So you have to have that closed loop system where once, the, once you detect that, your process is out of control, then put in these additional reagents to get it back to balance, right? So uh, di digital systems along with the automation for delivering those uh, additional uh, you know, compounds or chemicals and stuff, those sorts of things will be useful. Just having the sensors that feed you data and analyze the data is not gonna be useful. And uh, where you'll be able to make a big impact is where you can close the loop saying, look, uh, a, a great example is ventilation on demand, all right? If I detect that there is a work happening in a particular stop, automatically turn on the ventilation, right? So those sorts of systems, when applied to environmental problems or environmental use cases, I think have a huge potential. There's other environmental things like, you know, tracking wildlife, tracking, uh, you know, flora and fauna and, and things like that. I don't know how much digitization can help in, in, in those sets of use cases, but I mean, maybe you can start using image processing and whatnot to, 
to at least streamline and make that entire process more efficient for at least for data gathering. Sir, so, what about uh, blast related issues such as blast vibrations? Blast vibration um, to reduce the blast vibration or to do fragmentation analysis or what? Sir, to reduce, I mean, that is the main problem. To reduce blast vibration, that is beyond my capabilities. I know Amitava is is on. I, I saw Amitava on the call. <laughs> Maybe Amitava can provide insights into yes, how sir. technology yes, can. Sir. Yes, sir. Yes, definitely. So uh, yeah, there are a lot of uh, practical things for any blast design. Uh, so which involve your vibration, uh, then air over particle, air over pressure. So all those things. It depends on your effective design based on the rock strength and the charging. So. Suppose you have, let us uh, think of an open pit mine because the vibration actually it happens in the open pit mines more. So if you have a design blast and if you consider your burden to be <clears throat> very less, then there will be fly rocks. But if you consider your burden to be more, so that will actually do the back break as well create the vibration. So this is this is the basic concept of any blasting. So where you can control. Now to talk about digitization, how it can help. Definitely, if you can collect the data. So digitization help you in collecting the data and analysis of the past. So if you collect the data, changing your parameters like burden spacing, charge parameters, density of explosive, decking all these parameters if you can change and if you see the impact of that air over pressure and vibrations through that and then you uh, in the next set of blasting if you can apply that insights definitely you can reduce that vibration air over pressure fragmentations impact everything so that is the concept how digitization can help you in analyzing and implementing that uh, result to the actual blast. Thank you, sir. So, Nitish asked another question. How do you compare India and the rest of the world in terms of adoption and use of technology? Uh, what would be your opinion on the right time when adoption would increase in India and at what level? <clears throat> India lags behind, uh, obviously, North America, Australia, and South America. Uh, there is pretty high digitization. Uh, India, for whatever reasons, maybe cultural uh, reasons or, or whatever, seems to be very, 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 very slow. Um, and like I said, I think it's just organizational culture um, and the mindset. What is super surprising to me is India is a hotbed of technology, right? We, uh, you know, we do all the outsourcing of projects in the US and Canada and Australia and stuff. I'm not talking just about uh, mining Right, I'm talking about retail and whatnot. I mean, for example, what Wipro does, what Infosys does, and, and, and these sorts of things. And I'm like, well, why, are, why isn't the technology that they use overseas, why is it not being adopted in India? And to me, I can only uh, the, the only explanation I have is, you know, in India, they expect everything to be cheap and commodity rather than value-based, right? So that mindset, um, oh, and, and, and the other mindset is if they have an idea, right? They always think, hey, I can hire like six developers and just do it myself. That, that's, that's been the mindset of a lot of minds. Uh, so, uh, Since we are having uh, another event, we will like to wrap up here that we can conduct other events also.
That's fine. And if, if uh, you want us to come back and just have another conversation, more than happy to. Thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you another time. All right. Let me just say this is uh, thank you all for your time. I really appreciate it. And I hope you guys have are, are, are going to be leaving this uh, meeting slightly more uh, informed than when you started. Uh, more than happy to get any feedback offline. Just, just reach out to us. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Enjoy. Thank Take you, care. guys. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank care. you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.